Welcome, this is Zach and Maya Teach, but today's focus has more to do with you than with us. Assuming you clicked on this video seeing the word geometry and saying to yourself, ah, oh, shapes, I know what those are, then you've probably had an extensive mathematical e education and you know what geometry means. It also probably means that you have been taught Euclidean geometry, which, while beautiful, is only helpful if you live in flatland. Geometry, like other fields of mathematics, is built on certain postulates which can't be proven. Why? Well, there's no prior knowledge to prove them, that's sort of what makes them foundational. If you wanted to make your own branch of mathematics, and let's face it, some of you do, I think I'll call mine Zachmatics, you'll have to make some sacrifices and a couple of logical leaps. If you wanted to make a topological map of the curvature of a lump of pudding, or if you wanted to make the beautiful proof that is the Harry Ball Theorem, you'd have to have spheres, but you can't prove spheres. Spheres are spheres. Spheres are self-evident. Zach Maddox only postulated that dividing by zero is okay and it equals zero because if you divide by zero, you get positive and negative infinity, which when added together is zero. And zero is cool and I don't want it to feel left out. In the same way, the Greeks just assumed that some things in the universe were absolute and that from these things, you could build really complex mathematical rules. This is sort of the systemic problem with Greek sciences. You may have noticed that just about everything the Greeks said about science was wrong because a lot of their scientific inquiry wasn't inquiry at all. It was just sort of a group of assumptions. So when Aristotle had rotated around the Earth, he just said that because it looked like the sun rose and set and the Earth was fixed because he was on Earth and he didn't really notice that the universe was infinite. But you can't really blame him because the Greeks had a different way of looking at infinity than we do. For example, in his textbook, Elements, you could avoid saying there are infinite primes by saying there are more primes than in any given collection. So in a collection of 10 to the 1357th power of primes, there are always more primes. So it's sort of like infinity, a proto-infinity. To the Greeks and the Indians, the other mathematical center of the ancient world, infinity was not a conceivable concept, it was more of something that you could approach using very fine philosophy. But let's not get distracted. Using postulates, you can make a whole new set of mathematics. A set with a breadth of postulates is more stable than a set with only one foundational postulate because if for some reason one of the postulates is proven wrong, then there are other postulates that maintain the integrity of the math you've created. But let's say that you're an ancient geometer and you don't know much about the history of mathematics because, well, there isn't one. Let's actually say that you're Euclid and that you're sitting down to write the rules of geometry and you start writing out some of the self-evident postulates. Okay, so you'll be drawing a lot of line segments to show squares and stuff, so I guess that the first thing you say is that between two points you can draw a line segment. Now you also know that angles extend forever if you don't get the boundary, so you might as well call those indefinite segments lines. Oh, and also, with any segment you can make a circle, because, well, yeah. And all right angles start congruent because 90 equals 90 whether you like it or not. And there you go, you've got the first four of Euclid's five postulates. But something doesn't seem right. You set up with these postulates and you try to start making proofs and at first everything is fine until you start using parallel lines, but wait a second. How do you know that the line you're drawing is the only parallel line when proving that when two parallel lines intersect another line, the resulting angles are congruent? Aren't there others? Well, no. This is called the parallel postulate and it's Euclid's fifth and most controversial postulate. It states that if you have a line and a point that isn't on the line, then only one line that passes through the point is parallel with the original, and while that makes sense at first, it falls apart pretty quickly when you realize that space actually curves and the Earth is a sphere. When you add the curvature of space into the equation, Euclidean geometry, which is based on the parallel postulate, falls apart because you can have lines like parabolas and ellipses, which I guess are just parabolas that collapse onto themselves, and you can come up with infinite different lines that pass through a point and are parallel, meaning they never touch the other line. You see, Euclidean geometry is like an inverted pyramid, and if you take away the tip, the pyramid just crashes down onto itself. If there's no parallel postulate, then there's no Euclidean geometry, and then what? Can triangles angles add up to more than 180? That! Well, actually, yes, because on a spherical Earth, you can move in a triangular path and turn exactly 90 degrees each time, so you end up with a triangle that's 270 degrees. Okay, but I bet you can't make anything as beautiful as, beautiful as the Pythagorean theorem without Euclidean geometry. Except that you can because the Pythagorean theorem was made like a hundred years before all this geometry stuff was even invented. Plus the Pythagorean theorem doesn't actually work if your triangle is a right triangle but actually has three 90 degree angles, so ha! Without the parallel postulate you get all new sorts of geometry like hyperbolic geometry and elliptical geometry where they're both just complicated ways of saying that lines curve because space does too. All of this non-Euclidean stuff would make the Greeks cringe and it would probably make you get a bit unenthusiastic about life since his entire life's devotion was completely disproved. But when you think about it, that's the beauty in mathematics. 
Euclidean geometry is still not taught in school. Not because your administration thinks that your mind is too puny to understand the complexity of curvy lines, but because Euclidean geometry still has real-world applications and because it teaches you real-world skills like deductive reasoning and learning to deal with mundane things like proofs. And you can still go to college and learn about hyperbolic and elliptical geometry or topology or graph theory, which is sort of contingent to geometry, and then you can explain to your beloved math teacher why trying to find the area of a torus while in Euclidean ninth grade geometry is a pointless endeavor. Because in Euclidean geometry, things like tori would be unrealistic, and you should be focusing on the reasons why pi should be scrapped from the basic curriculum, and you should use tau instead. Here's what I hope you get from this. While something super complex and weird like curvy space in which all the laws of geometry fall apart seems daunting and overwhelming, it can actually be cool and exciting. But that shouldn't distract you from, from appreciating the simple things like how in flat space, there really is only one line that goes through a point that's parallel to another. Until you introduce perspective mathematics. This has been Zach and Maya Teach, Non-Euclidean Geometry.